Evan, thank you for coming. Um, I'll try and be brief about this, and I promise you today you're not going to get a lecture full of um, optically corrected pictures of buildings with no people in them. Um, instead, I want to try and talk about the future of, of the profession and where I see some of the influences that are going to be coming in on the profession. I'm going to talk about architects today, and I know this is a faculty of environmental design, but I'm talking to almost anyone who's involved in the built environment. And my faculty is called Architecture and the Built Environment because we have five different departments, social sciences, management, urbanism, architecture, and um, architectural engineering. And so the whole gamut we deal with, and it's everyone who wants to work on the built environment. Short thing about me, um, I always say if you wonder about my accent, yes, I come from up in Canada, and I'm out and about all the time. Um, on the, about a week before I graduated, I had an offer to go to work and live in Switzerland for a year, which I did in 1990, and I haven't been back since. So be careful what you ask for, you might just might get it. Um, you have to also know that I first started studying engineering, and I grew up in a family of computer scientists. My parents met at IBM. So I've had a very interesting sort of influence on how I see architecture and, and what designing is. And so I have this combination that has allowed me to have a professorship in computer-aided architectural design for many years in Germany. And then two years ago, I decided, yes, I would take up the challenge to run the school in Delft, which means I haven't left all my ideas, and even though I'm just an administrator now, it's a, just a different level of trying to push forward our profession. And basically what I want to show you today is the things that I'm thinking about, about how we need to react to unknowns that are coming at us. And the last point is that I've been working on with and, and on computers since 1974. My first computer was a PDP-11 with a 300 baud acoustic uh, coupler. And every time I tell people about this, the next people get up and say, well, mine was the first a Sinclair ZX-81, or you know, I had a 386 Amiga, or whatever. So it's interesting to, to compare notes on that. So what's about beyond 2020? There was a lot of talk in the last 15 years about you know, programs for 2020, and 2020 is sort of around the corner. It's just two years away. And we almost need to sort of get over the millennium thing and talking about millennials, like that's an old, an old hat. Right now we're closer to 2030 than we are to the, to the year 2000. And on top of that, we have, um, in addition to political uncertainties, we have technological uncertainties. We have things like machine learning, we have things like uh, self-driving cars, um, that all promise wonderful things and all promise terrible things at the same time. And especially for people that are involved in the construction industry and creating and developing, designing, maintaining, running, and disassembling the built environment, all of these things are going to play a role. And if we aren't careful, we'll get steamrollered by the technology. And so what we sort of have to do is to try and make some scenarios about how we might react depending on what happens. And so I'm not going to predict anything today except to say I'm, I know that things are going to change. And the only thing we can really do is try to be prepared for what if scenarios. And so what I'm going to show you is how I actually are, are trying to react to things is I usually end up drawing this kind of matrix. And the matrix is really simple. You just pick, uh, you pick a, a technology or a phenomenon and you say, for example, if I want to start a new business, is it going to be a small business or a, a large business? And do I want one that, that reacts slowly or quickly? So I'm, and then depending on that, you can create these four quadrants and try and determine what, how would you react to that. And so what I intend to do is show you three or four of these things and uh, to, in order to start a dialogue about where we might go as people who are responsible for the built environment. Ready? OK, first one, really simple thing, future of architectural practices. So in this scenario, I'm going to talk about two things that are coming at us. One is the issue of copyright. Do we have a copyright on the things we design? Or is it copyleft, that everything you do should be in the, in the public domain and usable by anyone? And on the horizontal axis, we have, are we legislated? So is architecture a protected uh, field? Is urban planning a protected field? Or do we have to make sure that we use innovation as our value for society and not on, on uh, on a kind of legislated protection. And depending on how you place your bets, you might come up with four different ways of running your business. And I want to just show that as a kind of demonstration of what I mean. So in, in this case, we have a, uh, a, a entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, who is 
betting that he's going to be protected as an architect and he's going to have copyright for his business. And that means anything he does, he can make sure that he has a legal protection um, to get royalties on anything he invents or, or does and that he's going to have a monopoly as an architect on his profession. And this is pretty much how architects have been working for the last 200 years. Um, I don't think it has much future, but for the, for the meantime, there are some people, if they can run the business well, they can exist for probably another 20 years in this mode. And this is basically how um, things have been working for the, the last while. If you have a disruptive technology like BIM come in, where the work you do in building a BIM model is not identified in the schedule of fees for an architect, then you're kind of screwed because everyone wants BIM, but if you're saying, well, I'm protected and this is the way we have to pay me, then they're gonna say, well, there is no way to pay you, so I need someone else. Enter the next one. This is someone who then says, okay, I can guarantee that I have copyright, I can do patents, I can, I can figure out and have a way to protect my intellectual property, but I'm not gonna be protected as an architect. I'm gonna rely on innovation. And that means thinking about new ways to service our clients, coming up with new kinds of services, but being able to rely on the rule of law, I'll say, or rely on copyright and, and the rule of intellectual property. Um, this, in, in some ways, works as long as you can maintain that, that forefront or maintain an advantage over your competitors. As soon as you let your foot off the gas, though, you end up having the following scenario. And that's where you have innovation, but no protection of, of, of your, uh, of your intellectual property. That's where you think of something, you give it away. And this is a very scary scenario because people say, well, there's no, there's no security anywhere. But it's also probably the most interesting scenario of all because that's where things are really fluid and really dynamic. And a little anecdote about this is about 20 years ago when CDs still existed, you know, we used to listen to music on these little round things. Um, they found about two containers full of bootleg CDs in Indonesia, and they were full of Peter Gabriel albums. And one of the reporters went to Peter Gabriel and says, well, what do you think about that? And Peter Gabriel just said, well, I'm gonna have to have a concert in Indonesia. And it was, you know, I can't get around the pirating of the CDs, but apparently there's a market for my music there, and they can't replace me. And that's the point is that if you are, if you are intellectually adept enough, it's, someone's not gonna hire you because you know something, they're gonna hire you because you're gonna think of something. People hire you for your potential, not for what you've done. And that's why this is probably the one to embrace, but it's also the most scary. And the other scenario is where we're back to legislation, architects are perfect, protected, but we have no protection of our intellectual property. And that's where something like an, a network of individuals where we collectively are working on the built environment can be a solution to that. And that means that it's a kind of guild system where you share your information among your practitioners. And we do this to some extent, but we always are trying to make a buck. And as soon as we can sort of get, a, get beyond that, this would be a potential to, to share information, share knowledge, and more importantly, share methodologies. And none of these scenarios are going to be the single one that's going to happen. It'll be a mix depending on where you are in the world, where the legislation is happening, and where the local e economy is happening. But if you've walked through this and you see these things happening, then you can say, well, the business of, of our, our architectural or design firm should maybe move in this direction of thinking about how to position ourselves. Got it? There'll be a quiz later. Um, there's always gonna be these quotes and little meandering roads talking about the future and sort of thinking to get you thinking along the way. And this is from a very famous management guru, which I love because taking the future in your own hands is the only way really to go forward. Future's coming whether you like it or not. Second one, digital profile. So now I figured out what my business is gonna be. The question is, who do I hire? And in this scenario, we have two, uh, two axes. One is, do we have strong or no growth or strong growth. So are we talking about 1% growth in the economy or are we talking about 6%? And then is our technological innovation going incrementally or do we have disruptive technologies? And depending on how you look at that, you can say, who do I, would I want to work in my company? So the first one is where we have strong growth but incremental technologies. And this is where you wanna hire gamers. The gamer mentality is that I'm gonna be obsessive about this thing. And whether it's um, whatever the, the DEFCON 5 or whatever the, the, the game is that's, that's the current one, 
or whether it's the building code, or whether it's a BIM model, you want people who are obsessive about getting that little extra bit out of it. They will go work on it for hours and hours and hours to get those incremental percentages and win. And, they, and people love to do that. The, the gamer mentality is one of just trying to know the rules inside and out to be able to squeeze anything out of it, to squeeze that small advantage, to be able to turn on the corner and shoot the other person in that game, or to be able to figure out how to maximize the, the uh, potential of a building plot in order to maximize the amount of revenue for your client. The next one, though, is if you have disruptive technologies, then you need hackers. You need people who are unafraid to open up the hood and figure out what's wrong with the machine. Because if we have disruptive technologies, and I'll say just, you know, something, something like BIM coming at us, where we have to reinvent how we present our services to our clients, means we have to kind of rethink what it is we're doing as planners in working with, with these technologies. And that's where you need that hacker mentality. You need the people who aren't afraid of technology. They aren't afraid of sort of disassembling the rules and putting them back together again. And you can see these kinds of people everywhere especially in a place like Boulder, where it's full of, uh, I'll, I'll say, people who are ready to think alternatively about what a lifestyle or what a, 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 a kind of business model is. You know, I, I have a feeling that in Boulder, someone could just sort of think, well, I'm going to start a business and it's going to be uh, creating arrows and repairing skateboards. And you know, no one would blink if you saw that on the street here. And that kind of mentality is the people you need when you have disruptive technologies coming at you. This is probably the scariest one. Always the lower, lower right corner is, is always scary. Um, you have disruptive technologies and no growth. If you have growth, you can always kind of grow your way or find a business model where you have a bit of profits to be able to put back into the thing. But if things are stagnating, then you really need to sort of take apart the, the, the whole machine and reinvent what things do for you. And that means if, if you're a, a, a construction company or a design company and, you, and you're working with maybe construction people, you need to reinvent a combined office or, ser or service for your, your clients. And I always think of the Apollo 13, scene, Apollo 13 scene where they basically say, you know, the, uh, the astronauts are going to run out of oxygen by the time they get back and they don't have the right filters. And basically the guys put all of the things that are on the Apollo spacecraft on the table and say, this is what you've got, you've got to find a solution. And they did, and the, Apollo, uh, the astronauts lived. And that kind of thinking is what you need when you have a, a disruptive technology coming at you, but you don't, can't sort of grow your way out of it or, or just generate extra profits out of it. You are basically are forced with a, a almost sort of survival technique there. And the last one we come around is, is a, a, a sort of simple idea, but if you have incremental growth and you have or incremental technology and you have stagnation, then you need to find with internally where you can have advantages. And data mining is nothing more than just going back and looking at what you've done and trying to learn from yourself. As planners, we often move from project to project to project, and we never take the time to stop and say, wait a minute, we just finished that thing and we made $100,000 of profit. How come? You know, what did we do that was right? We rarely do that. We're just like, okay, next project, you know, and hope, hope that you can just sort of maybe remember some of the things you did well or not well. And hiring someone to just go back over your archives and be able to look back and say, look, these, these steps went well, these steps didn't went work well. And you could then develop internally uh, reiterative systems that allow you to basically increase your efficiency or increase your effectiveness as a company. This was my, uh, I used to work for a, a, a professor in Karlsruhe, and at one moment he'd said this just in an offhand way with a student, and I wrote it down because I thought it was brilliant, that design is a replacement of chance with mistakes. And the fact is that a mistake is better than just leaving things to chance. And this is a, to almost a kind of impulse to say, try and make a decision, try and create a, an, an answer to something. It might be wrong, but it's better than just leaving things to chance. So once you've figured out how that, the, one of the questions is, where do you get help? Where do you try and find the next generation of people to work for you? How do you do that? And this is changing as well. In this case, um, I'm going to look at high tech, and by that I mean very uh, highly structured um, systems for education. And then I have this uh, one about whether they're independent or connected. And 
um, you might be surprised at what I say, what you, I, I show you here in, in terms of these categories. Um, in Germany, the single biggest educator is Siemens. Siemens has 350,000 employees worldwide, and about a third of those people take courses within Siemens to better themselves. And whether it's how to repair the next washing machine, or whether it's how to apply machine learning into the design of their factories, they have a consistently self-built system there. And these kinds of academies exist at Arup, they exist at all major corporations, and they're closed off to the world. There's an incredible amount of knowledge that is in, in corporate corporations that no one ever gets to be a part of unless you are, have sort of bought into the company. You said, okay, I'll be an employee, and then you get access to this. But you're almost sort of forced not to say anything once you leave the company, right? The, the, the motivation is, of course, for the, the workforce to be as good as possible, but it's not accessible to just anyone. You can't just walk in and say, I'd like to attend that lecture on machine learning. It sounds really interesting. And as, as planners, we sort of need to find a way to be able to be a part of it. And maybe part of that is if we can develop our own skill sets and our own knowledge to offer them to that. And if you're offering something into a system like that, then you probably will be able to get something back out of it. The other way to do this is just to be completely open, connected to everybody, and put all your knowledge in the clouds. And this is what, m what people are doing like at MIT, with MOOCs, with uh, open online courseware, where basically you let anyone allowed to take any information anywhere. And that means if you're in India, you can take a course in computer science from MIT. If you're in Vancouver, you can take a course on, um, on sustainability in, in the urban environment from Delft. Or if you're in Boulder, you can take a course from IIT in Bombay on, on how to manage water in third, third world systems. And this is a very interesting solution to knowledge and, and generating educa education, but it does have a, um, a couple of problems. One is you're betting the farm that the internet's going to exist in its current form and openness when you do that. And as much as anyone thinks the internet, of course, is always going to be there, it wasn't there forever. The internet is only 20 years old in terms of the World Wide Web. The internet itself as a network is older than that, but in terms of a, a public resource, is not that old. Even electricity is only 100 years old. Like if you look at what we did as engineers and, and planners and people in the built environment over the last sort of 300 years of North America, most of it was done with horses. Most of the work that was done was done with horses and, and men. The city of Chicago raised downtown in 1860 by two meters because the water kept coming in in the spring and filling the, the, uh, the inner city with the horse shit that came down the, the Illinois River. And so they basically made a decision, you know what, we have to raise the city. And they did it with jacks and horses and, and hammers. The internet's only 20 years old. So betting that it's gonna be there in 20 years is maybe fragile. The other thing is the cloud is one thing, but the economics of the cloud are still pretty cloudy. And so how to make that run as a business, how to, how to actually make money from something that's cloud-based is not clear yet. If you look at any of the, the big companies that are, that are working on that in the, with IPOs, they have yet to make profits. You know? Tesla, for all its greatness it, as an electric car company, has yet to make a profit. So betting on, on Tesla being, you know, replacing GM as the biggest auto manufacturer is uh, a pretty long bet. Another way to go about this, though, is just to say, okay, it's not going to be high-tech and highly integrated. It's going to be low-tech and low integrated. It's going to be made of nonprofits. It's going to be ad hoc networks. It's going to, it doesn't matter if it only exists for two or three years. We'll reassemble it and reconfigure these networks. And I come from the, the world of BIM and, and that. And BIM has been driven by ad hoc networks. It's been driven by the Interoperability Alliance. It's been driven by the Smart Building uh, Group, which is basically volunteers that have been making sure that there's enough effort put in to coordinate the information and put it in a structured way so that everyone can find it. And these things work if people are, are if you bought in on the ground floor, then you have access to everything. And the other thing about it is that you really need to make sure that you can, um, I'll say maintain the networks. It's, it, if you're talking about social networks in like Facebook or, or Twitter, the real social networks are the engineers and, and, and the, the academics who maintain things like this in order for the technologies to be able to propagate through the academic world. 
And then there are these things called universities. And universities, on one hand, are a great place to store knowledge. They're a great place to transfer it. That's why you're all here studying. That's why I'm an, in academia. That's why I wanted to become a professor. But if you're looking from the outside in, it's a place where things are really slow. And in all of the research that I had, had, had been done in the last 20 years of, of my career, I've never had a cent from the software industry. Even though I've been working on BIM for 15 years, I've never had a cent from the software industry. Any talks I've had with Autodesk have been like, well, that's all nice and great, Peter, but we need our results in three months. And the way we, your university works is we won't get a procurement PO in three months from them. So forget it. We need to have an answer now. And the way universities work in some ways is their strength. They're independent of the rest of the world, but it's also their weakness. And the danger is that if universities cannot connect to know what's going on actually in the industry, then they become disconnected and then they end up on their own little cloud and no one wants to talk to them anymore because it's all just full of people waving their hands in the air and they don't have any connection to what's really going on or needed on in, at the industry level. There was this professor of politics in Harvard who also w bombed Cambodia, so he should know. So what now? Um, and what I wanted to talk about now is what do you do as someone in this industry, someone who's caring about the, the built environment? And there are two more things I need to tell you. And one of them is, in this scenario, is to talk about what are the things, the conditions we need in order to push forward and, and I'll say be in control of whatever happens in whatever scenario. And in this case, there are formal and informal ways of doing this, and then there are short-term and long-term actions. And as always, I'm going to start in the upper right-hand corner, or upper left-hand corner. Welcome to the dyslexic club. Um, and walk around this. Um, and this is something that actually I'm quite passionate about because this takes a kind of civic involvement. This takes the involvement not just of saying, okay, the academic is community is going to write a letter to somebody. This takes everyone really doing their part to push the people who are responsible for creating the conditions to have a proper digital future. And I'll get to that in a second about why I say that. Quick wins is the first part. This is the short term but formal things. This is where your governments can do something in the short term. And I have a picture here of a, in, of a settlement in Jordan. This is Syrian refugees. And this is three years old, this picture. So it's been another three years. This was set up because the po local politicians said, we need, for the, the 50,000 people, it's now 200,000 people, we need some short-term thing because they're refugees. And there was this, this sort of, um, I would say myth, myth or lie told to the local people, well, they're just going to be here for a short term and then they're going to go home. And anyone who's seen anything on TV about what's happened in Syria knows that the people that are living in this city right now are probably going to be there for another 20 years. And so, but if you look at the, the structure of this thing, it's just tents, it's just housing. There's no schools, there's a hospital, sorry, I'm going to walk off camera. There's a hospital here. But the rest of the normal things we have, like commerce and public space and, and schools for the children, et cetera, weren't thought of when they made this thing. The short-termism didn't help. The Band-Aid solution is not what politicians are good at. They should have just said, look, we need to have some city planners plan this thing so that it can, it can grow and, if possible, become a city and part of, 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 the, of the, the environment in Jordan. But politically, that was unacceptable, and so they told this lie. And now, you know, 200,000 people live in this temporary, haha, temporary city. And worldwide, there are about 25 million people living in these kinds of conditions. There are 25 million displaced persons in the world. And that's about the population of the Netherlands plus some. My point is that if we're talking to politicians about what can they do in the short term, what we need is bandwidth. And if there's a, a hindrance to bandwidth, that's what the politicians can work on. Work on with the, the telecommunications companies to make sure that access to digital is there for anyone and in as fat a pipe as possible.
because if that's not there, the rest of the infrastructure won't matter. If you have a BIM model in the cloud and everyone's working on it, that's great, but if you can't get to it, then you can't be a part of that thing and you can't do your work and you can't get paid. The long term, we need basically our politicians to think beyond the four years and beyond the eight years and beyond the 12 or 16 years. And because I'm working in the Netherlands, I can use a, 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 a simple example. There was a flood in 1953 in the Netherlands, and it only covered about a quarter of the country. So you have to imagine, you know, a quarter of the United States went underwater. So what are you going to do about it? Well, a lot, a lot of people just say, why don't you move somewhere higher out of the way of the water? But if you look at the topography of the Netherlands, that's not an option. So what the, the, the government in the Netherlands did is they decided we're going to build a five meter dike around the entire country. And it took 40 years. And the last piece is this brilliant piece of engineering, which are these floating doors in the entrance to the, the harbor of Rotterdam. And that's about the size of the Eiffel Tower laid on its side just to give you a scale. And these doors float, and when the, uh, when the water comes in, if they have storm floods, they just close them. And that completes the five meter dike around the entire country. And it took 40 years to do this. And that means it took the citizens to remind the politicians that if they ever started to get off track and wanted to do some other kind of vanity project, to say, no, we're not finished. You can build your vanity project, but when you finish it, when you can do that when you finish building the dike. And that kind of long-termism is something that's really missing from our politics and it's missing from a lot of our, I'll say, citi citizenry to remind our politicians that there are some things more important than the things that come up on CNN because someone said some, I'll say, sound bite. There are longer-term things that we need, like markets, like building the conditions for digital commerce creating the legal structure for digital commerce, for micropayments, for macropayments, for long-termism, for 100-year leases, for all sorts of, of things that go outside of our current economic models. We need our politicians to work on those because those will create the conditions where if you, have, if you know there's a solid market where you can have a digital commerce, then people will start to become entrepreneurs. The one thing that I don't think entrepreneurial spirit is something you really need to learn. I think it's innate in us. As long as we know, we can, we can uh, be assured that the conditions we started our business with will continue to be one like that. And right now, this is one of the things that is not clear. If I go to the, to the ad hoc, or let's say the, the less formal version but long term, is the stewardship. And I want to just, uh, if you're not aware of the Habitat, the UN Habitat is a part of the United Nations, and it's a group that tries to make policy for habitation for all of humanity, for all of the members of the United Nations. And they have a conference every 20 years. They just had one, the third one, in Quito, Ecuador, last fall. And the next one is going to be in 2036. This is long-termism at its best. And this is where the, all of these people signed unanimously into the, the new urban agenda, which describes the policies that the member countries should be taking in order to assure and ensure strong habitation conditions for every citizen. And one of the things that's in this is, as a to-do, is about digital citizenship. So what does it mean to be a citizen on the internet? What does it mean to have identification? What rights do I have? What can I expect of my government? What can I expect of other governments? What, what is a, a digital passport? How can I transfer knowledge? How can I transfer commerce? These are things that are not clear yet and need long-term solutions for that. And there are people working on that, but we also need to remind the politicians and the people and, the, and the, I'll say even their apparatchniks that there are some pieces of the puzzle to a digital life that are still not yet finished. And before people start to get sidetracked on their own, uh, I'll say, poli political vanity projects, we need to remind them that there are some key things here, like a digital bill of rights, that haven't been done yet, and that they need to do that as their homework before they do anything else. And then lastly, this us ourselves, as, and I say this, the entrepreneurs, because creative destruction is also about what entrepreneurship is about. And that means also reinventing, if you're saying, well, I'm going to graduate here with my degree in environmental design, what does that mean? 
that mean, well, I have a, a business card that says, you know, Joe Slobotnik, environmental designer. And everyone says, well, great to meet you, Joe. What do you do? Or what can you do for me? Then you should have an answer. And I have a picture here of three architects from Delft. These are students who finished their, their third year and they said, we're going to take a year off. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to crowdfund something. We're going to get 10,000 bucks together, which they did. And they bought this house in Detroit. And they've turned it into a center for information about how to transform your house in Detroit in order to lower your energy bill. Because there are a lot of people in these low-income, degraded neighborhoods in Detroit where their energy bill is higher than their food bill. And they said, we want to make a difference. And so they stopped school and they started a, a crowdfunded thing, bought the house, and now have a nonprofit that's there. They've come back to school and they've got three or four other students from Delft who've taken over the project. They've reinvented what it is to be an architecture student. They figured out something that, that, that was theirs. This is the kind of thinking that we need to do. If we're just expecting someone to come along and say, I'm looking for an environmental designer. Is anyone here in the room an environmental designer? That's not how the, it's going to work. It's going to work because we define what it is that our value is. And that might mean cutting off some of the old ideas about what we thought we had in our identity. But it also means the whole potential there to reinvent that. One of my favorite quotes of all time from Niels Bohr, who was a semi-famous uh, physicist. What I like about this diagram here is it's a strange attractor, if you know about mathematics. And a strange attractor means you can't predict where, where the thing's going to be at any one moment. But if you look at the diagram, you can see, well, you can predict where it's basically going to be. And sometimes we don't need to know that exactness. We just need to know generally where it's going to be. And that's enough to make a decision to move forward. And some of, one of the, the things I think right now is we have a kind of obsession of, of uh, precision. You know, I was looking at, I, I hate looking at the, the, the television. They're telling me it's 15.4 degrees. And I say, well, it feels like 15.2. And especially in, in a room here where there's a three degree difference between the floor and the ceiling, it's a completely irrelevant statistic. If I look at my phone bill, it does it in th ten thousandths of cents. You know, it's like you made a call, it's 14.5473 cents. And that's just because they can do rounding errors and then you're gonna be squeeze another cent out of me from the telecoms company. But in theory, it's just, it, it's an irrelevant amount. And sometimes we don't need to know the details we just need to know the general picture. That's enough to move forward. So last point, uh, future of architecture. I have to make sure I'm not going on too long here. Um, this one is not a matrix. Because if the matrix is being courageous, yes or no, or yes at the, the right-hand side, and no at the left-hand side, and it's about being responsible from bottom to top, and yes being responsible, then all of these end up in the upper right-hand corner. And that has to do about a position of us who are responsible for the built environment. It has to do with about our economics, our commitment to being digital, and about the identity of who we are. And I'll just walk through these really quickly because this is where I have to uh, say that I'm, I'm taking a stand and what I'm giving you here is a bit of a manifesto about where I think we need to move as schools of architecture but also as practitioners and people who are in this for the money. It's also a business. Architects have protected title, and if I was going to say what's the single biggest hindrance to me moving my school forward, it's that it's a protected title. And that means that the Architecture Association says, well, you have to teach this and this and this and this and this for these people to be called an architect. And if you don't, well, then they can't be architects. And at the same time, I have, uh, I've had a talk with the architects from Graft Architects in Berlin, and, and they have offices in LA as well. And they told me, we don't hire a student in our office unless they know how to script Maya or Dynamo or Grasshopper. If they can't program, we have no use for them. We don't need architects who wave their hands and carry a 12H pencil in their hand and, and talk about the good old days. We need people who can program. But if I go and say to the Architecture Association, well, I want to start a minor in programming because this is what our students need to know, they'll say, well, if you do that, they won't be architects. The protection is the hindrance to moving forward. Short story. I love Ray Donovan. Yeah. 
He looks like an architect. He's wearing black. Um, in Europe right now, the European Union is considering making all of the manufacturers of, of, um, of components from buildings responsible for those components at the end of life, just like they do with the automotive industry or the telephone industry. That means when the glass is taken out 25 years later, because we don't need that window anymore, the glass company has to take the glass back and dispose of it. And Saint-Gobain and has a business model right now. Saint-Gobain makes glass, lots of it. Their business model is melt as much sand as possible <coughs> to sell as many square kilometers of glass as possible. That's our business model. But they say, wait, if we're responsible for it, we're not going to sell it. We're going to lease it to you. And if they start leasing it, that means that, well, I'm not buying the building. I'm buying a structure, but then I have a service contract with a facade company that's guaranteeing me a certain amount of, of thermal insulation and a certain amount of electromagnetic transparency over 25 years. And that means if that happens, and it probably will, that means the entire economics of construction are going to change. A building doesn't become a, a piece of real estate, it becomes a service industry. And if that's the case, and we as architects are trying to help our clients make decisions, we're not going to just sort of say, well, your building's built, thanks for the money, see you, good luck. No, we're going to have a continuous relationship with our clients as their service contracts become renewed or have an upgrade. Like, you know, Sangoba says, hey, would you like to have an upgrade on your windows? And they're going to say, ask the architect, should I get an upgrade or not? Won't work with my building operating system, will it? And so our relationship, our whole economics of what we do as architects will change. At some point, we have to just admit it. It's, if you're digital, you're going to be part of it. If you're not, you're not. And anyone who's not needs to be told that. And that means your construction company or your client or your engineer or your city needs to be told that it's BIM or no building permit. And that's happening in Europe. There are a lot of countries where ab above a certain threshold, that basically means anything above a doghouse, has to have a BIM model with the building permit. If it doesn't, you don't get the building permit. It has to be that we're not going to start building unless we've had a BIM model to check that there's no collisions or, 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 or problems with the building site. We don't want to be sitting there scratching our heads on the building site while the, while the clock is ticking and the bank is asking for money for the, for the mortgages, but we can't start charging people for rent. So our building sites have to be really efficient. It has to be basically BIM or no go or BIM or else. And that means just drawing a line and saying if we don't have a, a solid model, and it doesn't have to be 3D, it doesn't have to be Revit, it just has to be a digital model that describes the built environment that allows us to continue to work and add information to this as the, the piece of the built environment continues on its life cycle. That's all. And if we don't have that, we're going to be stuck in our inefficiencies and stuck in being irrelevant, if I have to call it that. People talk about a T profile for a lot of engineering, people in environmental design. We always say, well, we have a much broader part of the T and less depth because we, we know a lot about a lot of things, but not a lot, a lot about many things. And right now, we're working on what we call a pie profile. And that means I'm an architect, but I'm also, hmm. so I'm an architect and a computer scientist. I met a guy a few months ago in South Africa. He's an architect and a microbiologist. He started a business in analyzing the biotopes that are in our houses. So he takes a vacuum cleaner to the carpets and then runs genetic sequencing on that and can create profiles of all of the little bitty ugly things that live in your house. And he's created profiles that he can tell you if it's healthy or unhealthy for you. And you can analyze that and say the people that live in these kinds, with these kinds of, uh, I'll say, microbes in their house live healthily. And the ones that have these ones have these kinds of problems with respiratory diseases or anything like that. And he's self-taught as a microbiologist. And through that, he's created a business where he actually has to turn away business because he can't find enough people to help him because there aren't very many architects and microbiologists in South Africa right now. And I believe that the future of, 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 our, of our industry will be that people have these two-pronged approach, and that's really important because the big problems, 
like water, like massive urbanization, are going to need very interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams to solve them. And so we need to have those crossovers so that we can talk better with each other and understand the solutions that we're bringing. If we don't have that crossover, we'll be just be talking at each other. But if we have overlaps, then we can create a really solid team to be able to get to solutions. And a quote from me, and that's just that um, making decisions out of fear are probably going to be bad ones. And that's not, I can't prove it, but it's a very gut reaction. And if you're making decisions out of conviction, they might be wrong, but they're probably going to lead you somewhere positive. If you make decisions constantly out of fear, you're only going to be hiding and cowering, and you're going to miss the boat. Someone's saying, aren't you afraid about machine learning? And I'm like, nope, because this generation of machine learning is going to get eaten by the next one. And we're still going to be there as humans, watching it all happen. Last point. Um, and this is just sort of like, what do we do? OK, all this shit's coming at us. Um, what can I do? Well, I've got four, four things to say as a strategy. And I'm going to go down in the countdown. This is like David Letterman's top 10, my top four. Number four. The long term needs to start today. If something's going to take 10 years and you wait a year to start it, it's going to take 11 years. So start it today. And the anecdote about that is when the Berlin Wall came down, the Berlin Tennis Club decided we want to have grass courts. We're going to rebuild this Berlin Tennis Club again. We're going to go grass courts. So they sent their greenskeeper to Wimbledon. Wimbledon, the best greens in the, in the world. And they, and they went to say, how do you do it? And the greenskeeper in Wimbledon said, it's really simple. You roll the grass for 100 years. It's like Larry Summers said, the secret to a great university is just two things, a billion dollars and 100 years. That's how you make Harvard. And the little anecdote to that is that there is a, uh, that John F. Kennedy told in his inaugural address is about a French general who inherited a mansion and he asked his greenskeeper to plant these tall poplar trees that grow to, in order to have this beautiful way with these trees going leading up to his mansion. He said, you know, and, and plant them next month, you know. And, he's, and the greenskeeper said, well, you know, it'll take 40 years for them to grow to full size. And he said, well, then plant them tomorrow. If something is long term, it needs to start today. Otherwise, it won't happen. Guideline number three. This is what you see in France always. One train can hide the other. So the classic case is a train's going by, and everyone's waiting for it to go by. And then it goes by, and the people hit the gas and go across, and then the train coming in the other direction from behind it goes <laughs> And if you look at the statistics, this happens more often than you might think. The sign's not there just because someone thinks it's a funny idea. This happens a lot. People get caught up in one thing, and they miss something else. And in France, they had, in 1980, the Minitel system. The, and, and you were given this by the telephone company. It cost them a lot of money. But on this thing, in 1982, you could order a pizza. You could chat online with other people. It was the, advanced, it was the internet 20 years ahead of its time. They had a little thing like this in Germany called the BTX system. It was brilliant. You could order sex on it. You could order anything, you know, and you could chat with people and talk with them, and, and, and you had this little computer. It wasn't a video screen. It was a little text thing, like you would have like an, an old BBS. And France was really proud of this, and they, and they rolled it out, and it was doing really well. And the internet came along in 1990, and, and the World Wide Web. And a lot of French companies said, well, the internet, we don't need that. We've got Minitel. And they sort of ignored what was happening with with Mozilla and the World Wide Web and, and the, at, at the start of sort of the internet for the, mo mo the mass people, to the point where French industry, I would say, fell 10 years behind the rest of the world in terms of being online and being in connected with the rest of the world. Because they were so proud of their system, and it wasn't connected. Like, they didn't even say, we don't even need to connect the internet. That's a thing that'll go away in a few years. We have to be careful about being sucked into something like BIM because there might be something else happening at the same time in the industry. That's what all that the sign means. This one's even simpler. If you're not digital, you won't exist. In academia, I would say 15 years ago, if your papers weren't online, it didn't matter because there were scholarly searches that would go through bibliotheque references and, and, and whatnot. Nowadays, 
If your paper's not online, you won't be cited. If your business is not on the European procurement system called TED, you won't get any business. If you're not part of the, the digital system, you don't exist. This is my, one of my favorite pictures. This is Facebook. And it's not actually a map. It's just of all of the nodes with geolocation of where activities in Facebook took place, I think, in, 19, uh, or in, in 2013. It's a bit old. There's a couple of countries missing. China. Russia don't exist. Do you think Facebook cares? Nah. They don't exist. The Facebook world is fine with that. And if you, as an environmental designer, are not digital, no one will care. You just won't be part of it. The future is going to be digital. If you're not digital, you won't be part of it. Sorry. Or not. I'm not sorry. <laughs> the rule number one always is don't panic. We're pretty resilient as people. We're pretty smart. Maybe not so collectively, but in individually we're all pretty smart. And we're all pretty resilient about anything that comes at us. And any of these changing things are only going to be opportunities for reinventing ourselves if we're willing to abandon the things that are, hint are stopping us from moving forward. And sometimes that means throwing overboard the old ideas of what being an architect or a planner or a designer is and inventing that again. And it also means maybe reinventing the economics of it, but it's always going to be a chance. And, and if uh, there's anything sort of to be said from, from this lecture is that I know it's going to change. I can't tell you how, but I know it's going to change. And that's going to be a good thing. In 20 years, you'll look back and think, well, Boy, I'm ever glad I invented that, and I'll, I'll let, let you pick what it is, the combination of two things, in order to create that business. Because my professors weren't talking about it. It took us sitting around with beer on, on a Wednesday to come up with this new idea. And those kinds of ideas are probably going to be the ones that will be responsive to the changes that are coming in our society, and especially in the business of the built environment. And so with that, if you are that ready and prepared, then there won't be a problem because I don't know who said this, but opportunity blesses those who are prepared. And so if someone says and says, hey, you can go to Switzerland for a year and it ends up being the rest of your life, that's not a bad thing if you're ready. And so knowing that it's going to change just means trying to do a couple of what ifs so that you're ready when the, those changes walk in the door. And you're going to be the person that someone says, who here is ready to do this and this? And you'll be going, Thought. And the world is going to be yours. Thanks.